Okay, so I know it seems like my channel has just become like, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just responding to no longer vegan videos now. But you know, they keep coming out and a lot of them I think are worth responding to mostly for the same reason. So I'm kind of going to be repeating myself a lot here. But um, I don't know, I think it's useful primarily because a lot of the vegan responses are um, not great. So Bonnie Rebecca, uh, she's a vegan YouTuber. I think she said she was vegan for about five years, um, started her channel because she went vegan and um, was in the whole like high carb, low fat thing for a while. Uh, so she and her boyfriend, Tim, both gave up veganism. She's eating fish and eggs. Um, he's eating, I think, fish egg, also like chicken, both for health issues that they were having. She was having like digestion issues. He was having um, what started with like acne issues that I think they said started really early, like when they were doing the uh, kind of fruit-based raw, raw till four type stuff. And then later he started having uh, serious digestion issues to the point where he was like actually severely underweight. If it sounds like I'm very out of breath, I am because I'm very pregnant. So uh, get used to that. As always, you know, my little spiel that I give at the beginning of these, you know, I'm not here to bash Bonnie um, or Tim or anyone else who is no longer vegan, who is eating animal products, not at all. I get that veganism is hard. I get that it can be um, even harder, even impossible for people with certain medical conditions, you know, certain um, economic situations, etc. I'd just like to point out um, some of the problems that Bonnie and, and many vegans have when it comes to their approach to diet and their approach to medicine. Uh, so if you've seen any of my recent responses to, you know, some of these no longer vegan videos, you pretty much know where this is going. So like a lot of vegans, Bonnie has a preference for uh, certain doctors, these kind of functional medicine practitioners, naturopaths, aka not real doctors. A lot of people tend to like these doctors, especially people with sort of vague um, health issues, you know, like digestive issues, and um, people who are into more holistic, quote unquote, medicine. Um, they tend to like these doctors because they will usually run a whole bunch of different tests, right? And they will almost always tell you what's supposedly wrong with you. They will give you some sort of diagnosis. Doesn't matter that the tests are bogus, doesn't matter that many of the things that they diagnose people with, like leaky gut and adrenal fatigue are bogus, doesn't matter that the treatments, usually a butt ton of supplements are bogus, people just want to be told that they have this thing, that they have something. Um, in Bonnie's case, sort of leaky gut, intestinal permeability, and like a bunch of different allergies, and they want to be told what to do about it. Supplements. You can see this sort of mindset um, in a comment uh, from Bonnie on one of her past videos. It's a video from a few months ago where she first talks about all of this, where she first talks about her health issues. It's in response to someone rightfully pointing out that you know, maybe she should visit a real doctor instead of a naturopath. And she says, I'm definitely not against normal doctors. I just mentioned the naturopath because he has given me the most answers at this stage. She doesn't want to hear that her problems are nebulous and like, I don't know, maybe try eating less fiber, <laughs> right? Like she wants a diagnosis and that is a really bad way for any patient to approach medicine. This is how people get taken in by these naturopaths and end up spending a lot of money. As Bonnie says, she has spent a lot of money on these people and on their supplements. This is how people get taken in by going into a scenario, wanting something, wanting a diagnosis and wanting a treatment. So again, Bonnie's main issue was digestion. And it is true um, as I've already alluded to, fiber can be an issue for some people. Fiber is good for you. Fiber is really important for you know healthy bowel movements and a healthy gut. But there is such thing as too much fiber, and especially when you have a damaged gut or an bacterial imbalance, and your body is unable to break down food properly, too much fiber can be a bad thing, and it can cause inflammation. So it really sounds like she does need more protein and less fiber, which is something that the, um, I think a couple of the naturopaths and a dietitian that she saw that was recommended by a naturopath, this is something that they rightfully said that she needs to eat less fiber and needs to eat more protein. Now, the obvious way to do this would be to incorporate animal products, right? Foods that have zero fiber um, and to reduce 
you know, to replace plants with these animal products. Um, but it's not the only way, you know, there are mock meats, there are like protein supplements that you can use to get calories from and to replace a lot of the plant foods that she was eating, a lot of these foods that are, that have a lot of fiber because she was eating a whole food plant-based diet. Particularly since, as she says, this change that she made by incorporating fish and eggs, it's not a lot, it's only one meal. So her other two meals are plant-based and then um, for her third meal, I'm guessing her dinner meal or something, she's adding in fish and eggs or fish or eggs. And this wasn't even huge changes, by the way. Like these were just, you know, just one meal a day that I was kind of adding in either the fish or the egg. So my other two meals were still plant-based. So it wasn't even like I completely flipped up my diet. It was just like a small change that made all the difference. It seems like that's a, a pretty small amount of food. I mean, she doesn't say how much she's eating. Maybe she's getting like half of her calories just from, you know, a, a giant portion of fish or a giant portion of eggs. I doubt that's what she's doing, right? That would be, you know, she says she's still eating a plant-based diet, but that seems like the perfect opportunity to, instead of going for fish and eggs, go for, you know, some sort of mock meat. If it's just a matter of reducing fiber and increasing protein, which a lot of vegans need to do that anyway, um, then there's no reason to think that a mock meat wouldn't serve the same sort of pur purpose, assuming that you're not getting some of the mock meats that are like coated in breading, stuff like that, right? Or if she has a soy allergy or something, obviously that would be a concern because there are, there are a few, there are the, um, is it the Beyond Meat crumbles or pea protein based, the Beyond Burger, the Beyond Sausage, but those are really the only ones that aren't soy. So yeah, if she had a a soy allergy, you know, that would obviously be a problem. An actual soy allergy, like diagnosed by an actual doctor. But honestly, I'm guessing that she never even considered um, mock meats, anything processed. Uh, she doesn't mention it ever in the video. And again, she's coming from this kind of Whole Foods um, background. And look, a lot of vegans view mock meats as only a transition food, right? It's fine if you're like just going vegan or just going vegetarian or whatever to eat them, but they're not something that people should be eating long-term except like for special occasions, right? That seems to be how a lot of vegans view them. I mean, look at all the shit I get for eating mock meats. <laughs> it's a real problem when vegans represent the vegan diet as a whole food vegan diet, as that being the best vegan diet or just the best diet in general, because inevitably when it doesn't work for somebody, say like somebody with IBS, somebody who doesn't do well on a, a super high fiber diet, that person may not even consider that a diet with some more processed, you know, proteins some mock meats or even some processed carbs could be better for them. Similarly, when vegans represent the high carb, low fat vegan diet as the best diet, as the best vegan diet, and then they struggle with it or someone following them struggles with it, and then they don't even consider trying the opposite, right? Trying a low carb, high fat vegan diet. And you know, if Bonnie and others really like don't wanna give up on the, the whole food thing, then there's always oysters. They're not sentient, they're a whole food, they're full of nutrients that can often be lacking on these like whole food, high carb vegan diets that aren't properly planned. It's a good option. It's a nasty option. <laughs> you couldn't pay me enough to eat oysters, but it's an option. I mean, look, vegans get used to eating some pretty nasty shit. There's some pretty nasty vegan cheeses out there that you guys will eat. So I don't know. I find it funny when vegans are like, oh my God, I can't believe what like carnivores will eat. This food is so disgusting. It's like, y'all eat some nasty shit or just really sad. <laughs> Just some really sad meals. I'm not judging. I eat some sad meals too because I'm lazy, but you know, I don't present it as like, wow, look at this amazing meal. I know it's sad. Although trigger foods can be hard to detect and determine, you kind of have to do a whole process of elimination thing. The management of something like IBS is often diet related. But the same cannot be said for acne. Aside from some studies linking acne to high glycemic foods and also dairy, there's actually very little evidence linking acne to diet. It might be caused or made worse by zinc, by a zinc deficiency, but the mechanisms are not clear and the way that they are uh, testing this is with supplemental zinc, right? It's not like they're giving people meat 
or pumpkin seeds. So there's no reason to believe that a modest zinc supplement wouldn't resolve this issue for someone with acne if their acne was caused by a zinc deficiency. Now, in Tim's case, again, he's the one who was having the struggle with acne. Um, again, there is some possible connection between acne and high glycemic foods, and his acne started up when they first started eating this high fruit pretty high glycemic diet, so that could have something to do with it, but um, it sounds like he stopped doing that and tried other things and was eating a lot less of, you know, fruit and potatoes and stuff like that, and he still didn't see any results. So it could just be coincidence, you know? <laughs> it could just be like um, Nina and Randa when they were, I think they said they were 20, all of a sudden they just both got, you know, pretty severe cystic acne. And according to Bonnie, Tim has finally improved. Um, again, that could just be coincidence. It could just be luck. Or it could just be that his diet, um, even, you know, the various forms of veganism, you know, <laughs> that, that he was doing, the various different diets, um, that they were all just so poor, nutritionally poor, that it was actually causing nutritional deficiencies. And so eating animal products and getting in, you know, certain minerals, possibly even zinc, um, did clear up his acne. But certainly suffering with this for as long as he did. I think, I mean, it sounds like the, the whole time basically they were vegan. So I, I, he started eating animal products before she did, but it's like four years, I think she said. Um, it's far too long. As I mentioned in this video on Nina and Randa's really awful clear skin diet. Also, when it hasn't worked for someone, then it's only served to delay them getting help, which can be really bad with acne because of scarring. The longer you wait, the longer you deal with this severe acne, the higher your chance of permanent scarring, which is why dermatologists are often so quick to recommend drugs like Accutane because it's very effective and they want to minimize scarring for their patients. So Tim did try antibiotics for his acne um, and it sounds like he was confused or Bonnie was confused, I guess they both were confused, um, that it kept coming back after he would stop. And then eventually after starting antibiotics and stopping so many times, it just stopped working completely. So he took the antibiotics and he started eating more protein and his skin got better after like a month of taking the antibiotics, but his digestive problems were still pretty much the same, but it definitely cleared his skin. After three months of taking the antibiotics, he stopped and all of his symptoms came back. He then got prescribed another antibiotics for six months. He stayed on them for six months, it cleared up his skin again, and then he um, stopped and everything came back. And then she put him on another three months of antibiotics, except for this time he started taking them and nothing happened. His skin and his digestion just got worse and worse. Unfortunately, this is not uncommon. Nina and Randa talked about the same thing with their um, cystic acne. And this is, I think, absolutely a case where legitimate medical doctors, in this case dermatologists, are acting totally irresponsibly. Dermatologists make up less than 1% of U.S. physicians, but they write 5% of all scripts for oral antibiotics. In my experience, perhaps less than 50% have bought into the concept that they are part of the problem, so it's still an uphill climb to really convince people that although antibiotics make people better in the long run, they are doing us harm. When it is necessary to offer antibiotics, dermatologists need to ensure that they put an exit strategy in place by informing the patient that they will be on antibiotics only for the short term. Tell them, you are only going to be on this for two months. At the end of two months, I am going to take you off this period, and the topical medication that I give you is what is going to stop you from relapsing. Never ever should a patient just be on an oral antibiotic. At the very least, they have to have benzoyl peroxide, and they have to use a retinoid. To be fair, this isn't totally the doctor's fault. As the article explains, many patients do not like benzoyl peroxide because it stains, it bleaches fabric. Dermatologists are concerned that if they just prescribe that, that patients will stop taking it because it stains and they'll just stop using it. And also it's a lot easier to just pop a pill than to put cream on your face once or twice a day. In other words, it's hard to do a good job in a capitalist medical system where patients demand bad treatment. But none of that is to excuse, you know, doctors not properly educating their patients on what they are prescribing and on all the viable treatments and also staying up to date on any advancements in their field. It sucks that seemingly it was never explained to him that antibiotics are not a long-term solution, but that doesn't mean that eating chicken is going to cure acne. Again, I'm absolutely sympathetic, especially in Tim's case, because it sounds like he was 
um, really like fading away in terms of his weight and everything. So I absolutely understand just turning to whatever food could possibly put the weight on him. But just for other people who are just looking at acne specifically, you know, if it is a problem of, you know, too much fiber, not enough protein, too many high glycemic foods or something, then a vegan diet high in fat and protein, particularly from, again, mock meats, could be just as effective. Or again, oysters. So the last thing I want to talk about is cognitive dissonance. And this is basically when there is a disagreement, dissonance between your beliefs and your actions. So for instance, the belief that it's wrong to kill animals, that they suffer, etc., and the action of purchasing meat, which promotes that. So when there is this dissonance, most people tend to employ a process of rationalization to change their beliefs rather than to change their actions. In other words, the belief almost always is the, the loser, right? It's always the one that gets edited to be compatible with the action rather than the other way around. So in the case of, you know, believing that it's wrong to go animals and then eating meat, well, you change it so that, well, maybe there are cases where it's actually okay, <laughs> right? So that then you don't have this dissonance anymore. So Kal-El is a good example of this. I responded to her video about no longer being vegan. It's very similar to Bonnie's um, pretty recently. She started eating meat because of advice from some quack doctor um, when she wasn't happy about, you know, she didn't want to do it at first, but then she was okay with it um, and, you know, starts talking about how she found an ethical source of meat. Moon and Rock, uh, Megan, I think was her name can't remember. Um, but she did the same sort of thing, you know, saying that the, the sources that they found were ethical. Bonnie essentially does the same thing. Again, she's eating fish and eggs and she says just very briefly that she's uh, comfortable with the source. The reason I'm eating eggs and fish and not like chicken and meat is because I don't feel comfortable eating chicken and meat. Like I... I don't know if I ever will, but right now I don't feel comfortable doing that. So that's why I'm eating fish and eggs. Ethically, I feel okay with that decision. I feel okay with the eggs that I'm buying and the fish that I'm sourcing. Again, I'm not here to tell her what she can and cannot do. I absolutely have sympathy for people who struggle with things like digestion, even acne, especially severe acne where um, she showed a picture of Tim and it looked like he had some pretty severe acne. And again, the weight and everything where he was, I mean, it sounds like he was really in a serious trouble. People struggling with these things and not feeling as good as they could and uh, seemingly changing their diet a lot and nothing seems to help, absolutely sympathetic. They started with like ultra restrictive, you know, raw fruit-based, like raw to four type eating and then went to like the still high carb, but at least there's cooked foods, <laughs> um, like starch solution type thing. And then they started eating a more balanced um, whole food diet with some more protein and more fat and yet they still had problems. I don't think they exhausted all options, but I also don't expect people to be a martyr for veganism and to just stick with it and keep trying new things indefinitely. I don't think that's fair. The truth is that Bonnie feels much better now eating mostly plants still. As I mentioned before, she's having like two meals a day of uh, plants and then just having some fish or eggs with her third meal. She's still making a huge difference. Uh, that's still terrific. However, you know, saying that she's comfortable with the source, you know, I don't know if she was just kind of trying to brush it off because she didn't want to talk about it, which, you know, I think makes sense. Like maybe she's not actually um, comfortable with the source. I think that would make more sense. But just going by her words, she thinks it's it's ethical. Um, now, you know, I've made the case for very specific animal products like eggs and very specific cases of eggs that could be ethical. I don't believe it's ever ethical to kill a sentient being for food, unless there are literally no other options. And I think in Bonnie's case, there are other options. Again, oysters are another option. And yet over and over again, we see vegans going back to animal products and convincing themselves that it's okay and saying things like, oh, there's actually an ethical way to eat meat and it actually can be done humanely, even though that's something they would have vehemently <laughs> disagreed with when they were vegan. I'm not saying that Bonnie or anyone else should be constantly beating themselves up, <laughs> you know, over something like this, but I do think it's important to be honest, at least with ourselves, about the harm that our choices are causing, even if it's something that we feel like we um, have to do, or like maybe Bonnie's just like, no, I'm not gonna eat oysters, I don't like it. It's like, well, that's fine, but then don't 
pretend, <laughs> you know, don't try to rationalize your choice to kill fish. I think we can be brave enough and honest enough to live with it, you know, to live with these things. Because it's not just being vegan. We, we all do things that aren't the best <laughs> that we could do. You know, we can all do better. And I think it's really important to be honest with ourselves about what those things are um, and to try to figure out what those things are if we don't know. Um, and to really understand that we're not perfect, to give ourselves kind of room to grow and to try to be better people and to always try to live a less harmful life as best we can. So in Bonnie's case, you know, in this specific instance, um, again, trying the mock meat route or trying oysters, or if she doesn't want to do that, or if, or if maybe she tries it or actually has tried it and it just doesn't or didn't work for her, then donating money to some effective uh, charities, I think specifically charities that push for in vitro meat, clean meat, whatever you want to call it, like the Good Food Institute, that would be really awesome. And I think I think it's a good solution. I think offsetting harm via charitable giving is um, a really good idea for anyone who is struggling to stay vegan. So I saved this for the end because it's pure speculation on my part, but I felt, I don't know, it might, it might, I don't know, I might cut this out of the video. <laughs> well, I already tweeted about it, so fuck. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier, Bonnie um, and Tim, you know, started by eating a high-carb, low-fat vegan diet. I think, you know, mostly like the fruit-based thing, and then they went more of the kind of cooked starchy thing, like a, a starch solution, you know, McDougal, more potatoes and rice and stuff like that. It seems like they did this for uh, kind of most of the time they were vegan, maybe. Um, she even had an ebook. She sold an ebook that was like high carb, low fat recipes. I bring this up because it seems like so many of the high carb vegans who end up going back to animal products do so because of digestion issues. I mean, is it possible that eating such a, a shit diet <laughs> for so long, you know, a diet that is so low in fat and protein and so high in volume from, you know, fruit, potatoes, all this stuff, could it be that such a diet does sort of lasting damage? I mean, I can say that I'm I'm one of those high carbers who had di digestion issues, right? <laughs> Especially when I was doing the fruit-based uh, 30 banana a day thing where I was eating like a ton of calories and really like eating these super high calorie fruit meals where it's just like insane the volume, you know, 64 ounce smoothies and shit, right? My main reason for stopping that besides weight was just digestion. Like my, it was always so noisy. My stomach was constantly making noise. I think I talked about that before being like in the movie theater and just like praying that my stomach didn't when there was like a quiet part in the theater and sometimes it would. It was so embarrassing. Um, and it was just always temperamental. I never knew like when I was going to need to go to the bathroom. Then when I finally reintroduced cooked foods into my diet, my digestion got worse again. Mostly I think because I went from eating zero legumes to eating a cup of legumes. They were cooked. It was mostly lentils. I remember having like a cup of lentils uh, in a salad. I would do like romaine and avocado. It sounds weird, but man, I freaking loved it. It was so good. I ate that every day for, I don't even know how long, but um, yeah, it kind of, kind of fucked me up. I would have painful gas and bloating pretty much every single night for months this went on. I think it stopped once I finally started taking some Beano because I just couldn't take it anymore that's when I felt a lot better. And even for years after that, I was still noticing little improvements. For instance, one of the things I didn't like about eating cooked foods again is that I didn't feel satiated and it was hard for me to keep my uh, calories low enough. I think just because I was so used to insane volumes of food, you know, insane amounts of fruit that having just like normal size meals, it didn't feel right to me because for me being full was uh, pretty much being stuffed. I remember when I was doing the response to High Carb Hannah's stupid potato cleanse. This was like a few years ago, I think now. Wow, that's weird. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but I think it was. But I remember having like a, a plate of potatoes, like not an entire huge plate. Like it wasn't really that much, but I remember feeling so stuffed and thinking like, who the hell can eat this? Like who the hell can do this potato cleanse? And then it dawned on me like, oh, me. <laughs> 
like I used to eat like this. I used to eat this amount of like starchy stuff and fruit and everything. This is absolutely something I could have eaten and then some. I would have eaten more stuff with it like just a few years ago when I was eating, you know, lots of carbs. I, I think it had just... I think things had just changed so gradually since I had been eating, you know, less carbs and focusing more on fat and protein and not eating so much fiber and eating just like normal size meals that I hadn't even noticed that I guess just how much my digestion and kind of sensitivity to volume had changed. I'm not saying that Bonnie and others should do what I did and just eat a shit ton of beans and suffer and tough it out until things get better. Again, I don't think anyone should be a martyr and honestly, if I could do it over again, I'd probably do it a little bit differently, maybe be um, a little bit less crazy with the transition. It was pretty brutal for a while. I don't expect anyone um, to do that. I don't expect anyone to be a martyr or anything like that. But I do think that it's possible that eating fish and eggs now doesn't have to be a forever thing. It may give Bonnie kind of the break that her body needs from all of this extreme dieting that she's done in the past, which, I mean... But it's important that we view it that way, right? Like this, this high carb eating is very extreme dieting. And um, yeah, it could be that now eating animal products, eating less fiber because she's eating these animal products, um, also possibly getting in nutrients that she wasn't getting. I know she mentions iodine and for a long time she wasn't, she has a whole video where she started eating salt again a couple of years ago. She wasn't using any salt and even the salt she starts using is like Celtic sea salt that's not iodized. Point is doing what she's doing now could give her body um, some time to recuperate <laughs> from her dieting past and maybe allow her in the future to return to, well, not even return to actually try to eat like a normal vegan diet. Anyway, I guess that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. I know it's been a long time since I posted. Been busy with, you know, life stuff, <laughs> family stuff, house stuff, that sort of thing. Probably have something up for patrons soon, something a little bit kind of fun, I guess. Um, someone had asked me to go over, um, I don't know if you can see them in this shot, but sometimes you can see my kind of movies and stuff I have up here and I have a, I have way more movies <laughs> in boxes. Oh my gosh. Um, but someone asked if I would, you know, kind of go over them and talk about what, what movies I have. So I think I'll do that for patrons. It's just something a little bit fun. And honestly, I'm, I feel so rusty. I haven't recorded in so long. It, it was weird recording this. I don't, I don't know why I just feel, I just feel weird. So maybe that would help where I can just sit and talk about movies and I don't really have to, have to think too hard about it, I guess. And I like talking about movies. If I were good at it, <laughs> if I were good at it, I would actually, you know, do it and make, you know, videos for the, for the public like I did at one point. But then I realized I'm not good at this. I don't really have anything interesting to say. <laughs> it's good though. You know, it's, it's good that, uh, it's good to have those experiences, I think, to, to try something and to do it and then go, hmm. I kind of suck at this, but that's okay. I mean, look at all the shit I get for eating mock beans. <laughs> Even though I've been vegan now for over a decade, through two pregnancies, no cravings for animal products. Just saying. <laughs>